Hey everybody, Pastor Steven Anderson here from Faithful Word Baptist Church in Tempe, Arizona. So recently this guy put out a multi-part series supposedly debunking me and I'm going to go through these videos and just show how completely wrong he is and uh, I'm just going to start with where he starts in part one. He starts kind of abruptly but here's how he starts. We know that the Jews of Jesus' day looked on the Gentiles with condescension, believing that they were forsaken by God. But in the book of Acts, we read of God extending His grace to the Gentile nations of the world. Now imagine those same Gentiles, having been saved and welcomed into Christ's church, looking back at the Jews with condescension. Paul, who was inspired by the Holy Spirit and who knew human nature, warned of that very thing. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. So he starts out talking about how the Jews of Christ's day had a condescending view toward the Gentiles and believed that they were forsaken by God. And then he's trying to say that we have that exact same view in reverse. That's ridiculous because the Jews of Christ's day that had that wrong attitude, they didn't even want to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, okay? They wanted to just let the Gentiles go to hell in a handbasket and to just be God's chosen people. Well, that's not what we believe because we want to reach the Jews with the gospel and then they'll stop being Jews. We want them to stop being Jews and start being Christians. They're involved in an antichrist false religion. The Bible says, who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. And so today's Jews that deny the Father and the Son, according to scripture, are antichrist. Okay, we don't believe that they're forsaken by God in the sense that they can't be saved. Hey, they can get saved whenever they want. Whenever they want to repent of their wicked Judaism, and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, they can be saved. And by the way, Jews have been saved as a result of watching our film, Marching to Zion, that he hates so much. I have baptized Jews that were reached through that film, okay? So we're actually reaching Jews. I wonder how many Jews he's reaching with the gospel by telling them, you're okay, I'm okay. And, you know, we're both God's chosen people. That's garbage, okay? So it's not that we don't want them saved it's the we want to get them saved but we have to tell them that they're in a false religion so the the parallel doesn't match here we independent baptists have among us the very teaching i just described a wicked teaching that contradicts scripture and the very nature of god replacement theology is the heretical idea that god has abandoned the jews and replaced them with the church just as the jews underestimated the wideness of god's mercy so do these Christians misunderstand God and His intentions. We don't underestimate the wideness of God's mercy. Whosoever will may come, but they have to come. His mercy is that if they believe in Jesus, they'll be saved. It's available to everyone. A God who is not able to deliver His own people is a very small God. And in fact, He's not the God of the Bible. Of course God is able to deliver them, but they have to believe in Jesus. Okay, what is this guy talking about? Like we're saying that they can't be delivered? Of course they can, if they believe in Jesus. They don't get a free pass for being Jews. Stephen Anderson, the false teacher of Phoenix, has put together a video recently entitled Marching to Zion, in which he completely turns the Bible on its head in an attempt to prove that the church has replaced Israel. I first became aware of Anderson, as I'm sure a lot of people did, when he got into a scuffle with border guards in 2009. Okay, so here's where he just changes the subject completely and just goes on the ad hominem attack, trying to just poison people against me by making me look bad or something. So he starts out by saying that I got in a scuffle with border guards. That is a lie. I was not at the border. Those aren't border guards. That is not the U.S. border. That is 75 miles away from the border where I was driving on a highway that goes from east to west that never crosses the border. I was traveling within the United States and I kept getting stopped at checkpoints over and over again every single week that violated my constitutional rights. And I stood up for my rights as an American and I was found not guilty of all charges in court. And even the jurors were coming up to me and thanking me 
for standing up for our rights as Americans. So, no, I didn't get in a scuffle with border guards. I wasn't at the border. I wasn't crossing the border. And I didn't get in a scuffle. I was basically beaten and tasered by 12 armed men as I sat unarmed in my car just trying to go to work without an unlawful search and seizure. But that's another story that shall be told at another time. He struck me then as being someone who was looking for attention, but I never would have believed he would have attracted a following. I never thought he would have attracted a following. He's acting like in 2009 he saw this and, and just thought, oh, this guy will never... I already had a huge following in 2009. Uh, over 20,000 MP3s were being downloaded from our church website before that Border Patrol incident even happened by early 2009. Not only has he attracted a following, his teachings are infiltrating independent Baptist churches all over the world and are creating much havoc. I know of numerous cases where Andersonites have torn families and churches apart with their false teachings. Not only that, but Anderson sports a strange attitude for someone who claims to be saved by grace. He prays for people to go to hell. Here he's praying for Barack Obama to go to hell. The sermon that he's referencing about Barack Obama, I quoted scripture where David is praying and says, let them go down quick into hell. So basically I prayed exactly word for word what David prayed in Psalm 55 and 18 other imprecatory Psalms where he prays things of that nature. So because I prayed exactly verbatim Word for word in that sermon, I reference scriptures. Of course, he'll take little media sound bites that cut out all the scripture. Exactly word for word, let them go down quick into hell. Break their teeth, O God, in their mouth as a snail with melteth. Let them all pass away. You know, all these different quotes from scripture, it, they're unchristian to him. Well, I thought the New Testament tells us to sing psalms. So anything in the psalms is a right Christian attitude. I would like to break down marching design into its main points and compare it with Bible doctrine in hopes of showing that he is unfit to lead others. So now that his ad hominem attacks are done, he actually gets back to the subject of this first installment, which is about the Jews and Israel, etc. Here's the essence of marching design. Israel is not Israel, the Jews are not the Jews, and God is no longer interested in the land promised to Abraham. Okay, so let's break that down. Israel's not Israel. Well, you know, that's directly from the Bible. Romans chapter 9 says, For they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. And he goes on to explain that the children of the promise, the spiritual seed, are the true Israel, the true children of Abraham, and that the children born after the flesh are not Israel. So the Bible flat out says they are not all Israel which are of Israel. And he's horrified by this, you know, Israel's not Israel. Yeah, the fake nation in the Middle East that's called Israel is not the true Israel of God because they are not the people of God, according to Romans chapter 9. Okay, then it, Jews are not Jews. Again, the Bible teaches exactly that thing in Romans chapter 2 when it says... For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, okay? So if I look at what he calls Jews, these outward Jews, and say, well, these aren't Jews, these Jews aren't Jews, these outwardly Jews, he's not a Jew, which is one outwardly, he's a Jew, which is one inwardly, I'm saying exactly what the Bible said in Romans 2, 28 and 29. He's apparently horrified by the Bible's teaching on that subject. And then he said that God is no longer interested in the land promised to Abraham. Like God is just so into land or something. You know, God has always been interested in people and a nation of priests and believers and a peculiar people. Like he's just so into the, Stephen Harrison doesn't think he's into land. He, he, you know, he doesn't care. Of course he has plans for that land. You know, he, he's going to, do some terrible things to that land uh, during the tribulation and during the outpouring of his wrath. A lot of horrible things are going to happen in that land. And uh, those cities are all going to be destroyed and they're going to be punished and God's wrath is going to be poured out on that land. And then eventually, yeah, Jesus Christ is going to return and reign from Jerusalem and set up the millennium. We're not in the millennium yet, folks. 
the Antichrist is going to come before Jesus Christ sets up his millennial reign. So yeah, God's got some plans for that land to pour out his wrath on it uh, before he returns and sets up his kingdom. That means a lot of the language in the Bible must be spiritualized. And when you do that, it's very easy to lose your footing. Yeah, well, guess what? It's a spiritual book. Of course, it has to be spiritualized. And the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, neither can he know them. They're foolishness unto him. Why? Because they're spiritually discerned. This guy has no spiritual discernment because, by the way, spoiler alert, this guy's not even saved. Later, he's going to attack us for the gospel that we preach in a later installment because we teach that salvation's by faith alone and that people don't have to give up their sins or be willing to give up sins and turn over a new leaf to be saved. So because we don't believe that and we believe salvation's a free gift that's by faith alone, he says that we're preaching another gospel. Well, that makes him unsaved, okay, for not believing in salvation by grace through faith. He has enlisted several other independent Baptist pastors who agree with his point of view to make it appear that this is a widespread belief. Actually, it is a widespread belief, which is why Marching to Zion has been such a popular movie and has so many th millions of views on the internet. It literally has been viewed over a million times. And there are tons of churches, preachers, entire denominations that, in fact, this is what everyone believed before the late 1800s. So yeah, being against Zionism and believing in covenant theology or replacement theology is an extremely wide held belief. To set the record straight, Jesus Christ came as a light to two specific groups, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. Of course he came to reach those two groups, but they have to believe in Jesus in order to be saved. And in order to be God's people, they have to believe in Jesus. Yeah, he came to reach two groups, Jews and Gentiles. Great. Yeah, they both have to get saved. Those who are saved by faith in Christ form a third group, the church. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. So according to him, if you're saved by faith in God, you're the church. Wrong. That's not what church means. Church is an assembly. Church is a congregation. Okay, Psalm 22, 22, in the midst of the congregation will I sing praise unto thee, is quoted in Hebrews chapter 2 as in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. Guess what? I'm not congregated with every saved person on this earth. Okay, every saved person isn't the church. The Bible uses the word church in plural, churches. Okay, so when it says don't offend the church, he's talking about not offending the assembly of people, the congregation of people that are gathered together as a unit, they have a pastor, they're a called out assembly of born again baptized believers. This guy has this universal church doctrine or Catholic church doctrine, Catholic means universal, where he believes in the invisible universal church or something that's just made up of all believers. That isn't true, friend. Uh, that's not some third distinct, you know, there's the Jews and there's the Israel and then there's the church and the church not replaced. Wrong. He's saying, look, don't give offense to the Jews. Don't give offense to the Gentiles. Don't give offense to the church of God. He's not categorizing every person into three groups. That's a total twisting of the scripture. The church did not replace Israel. These are two separate groups and God has plans and dealings with both of them. Jesus said, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits there. He said that he would say to them that were his people, you're not my people. And that he would say to those that were not his people in the past, you are my people. In the place where it was said unto them, you're not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Romans chapter 9. And so the Gentiles, according to 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, in time past were not a people. Now they are the people of God. Okay. Whereas the Jews used to be God's people, but the kingdom of God was taken from them and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruit thereof. So no, the church does not replace Israel. Christians replace Israel because again, we don't believe in a universal church. We believe in local churches and the local called out assembly of believers. And it's Christians in the New Testament that make up the holy nation, whether they be Jews or Gentiles. If they're in Christ, they're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Very simply, God chose Israel as his representative nation in this earth, but they failed him. In Deuteronomy 28 and many other places, God warned them of the consequences of unbelief. The warnings included severe judgments, ultimately being thrown out of the land he had given them. 
And it shall come to pass that as the Lord rejoiced over you to do you good and to multiply you, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you and to bring you to naught, and ye shall be plucked from off the land whither thou goest to possess it. The prophecies of Deuteronomy 28 have been fulfilled to the letter, but that is not the end of the story. Right, because over and over again in the Old Testament, he told them that when they got right with him, he'd bring them back into the land. And that already happened a few times where they get right with God, he brings them back into the land, they sin, he punishes them and takes them out of the land. But they always had to get right with him before he would bless them again. He's not just going to come back and say, hey, I know you guys still hate me and you still reject me and, and still in disobedience, but you know, I'm just going to go ahead and just forgive you and bring you back into the land anyway. That never happened. Throughout the Old Testament, God sent prophets to remind Israel, no matter what their hardships or failures, God would one day permanently redeem them for His own name's sake. Okay, so how are they going to be permanently redeemed? By believing in Jesus. Yeah, He sent Jesus to permanently redeem them for His name's sake. That's called eternal life. That's called being saved and having everlasting life. That's the only way you can be permanently redeemed. What is, you have some permanent political redemption for Israel? So, so unsaved, unbelieving, Christ-rejecting Jews are getting this permanent redemption for his name's sake. That's garbage. There's no redemption without Jesus. In him, we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. That's the redemption that's permanent that the Bible prophesied. There is no permanent redemption outside of Jesus Christ because you're a Jew. You can just get put back in the promised land and then die and go to hell. It's ridiculous. But Zion said, The Lord hath forsaken me, and my Lord hath forgotten me. Can a woman forget her sucking child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget, yet will I not forget thee. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. And then in Isaiah 45, 17, But Israel shall be saved in the Lord with an everlasting salvation. Ye shall not be ashamed nor confounded world without end. Amen. Israel is saved with an everlasting salvation. Folks, that can only be through the blood of Jesus, meaning that anyone who does not believe in Jesus is not part of that group. He is applying these promises about an everlasting salvation for Israel to Christ-rejecting, Christ-hating, unbelieving Israel. It's insane. He thinks the Jews over in Palestine today in the so-called state of Israel are, are being referred to when God's going to bring an everlasting salvation. It's through Jesus. They have to believe in Jesus. They don't believe in Jesus. Therefore, they're damned. They don't have any kind of salvation uh, this doesn't apply to them. It's, it's ridiculous. To make this video as brief as possible, I'm going to lump some of his major points under a few headings to simplify a somewhat confusing presentation and then give an answer to those points. There's nothing confusing about marching to Zion. Okay, it's not a confusing presentation. Everybody who walks, watches it walks away understanding it perfectly and the vast majority of people walk away believing it and agreeing with it. Okay, what's confusing is how this guy wants to defend Christ-hating, Christ-rejecting Jews as somehow being God's chosen people and having some everlasting salvation outside of Jesus or something. That's what's confusing. First, Anderson attempts to prove that the Jews are forsaken by God because of their apostasy. How in the world could anyone disagree with that? That if you don't believe in Christ, God is going to forsake you as a people. I mean, what if you had a nation that was a Christian nation in the past, and then they just totally stopped believing in Christ, they didn't teach their children, and eight generations go by, and pretty soon the whole country's Buddhist, or the whole country's Hindu, or the whole country is Muslim, or something like that. And you say, well, yeah, you know, God has forsaken this nation because they don't believe in Christ. How could anyone disagree with that? How in the world can he think that God is still with Israel even while they don't believe in him? The Bible says, He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him, unless you're Jewish. Well, actually, the context of that verse, John 3, 36, was spoken to Jews. It's John the Baptist talking to Jews, saying, look, if you don't believe on the Son of God, 
you have God's wrath abiding on you. How can that not apply to Jews? First Thessalonians 2 says the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost, the Jews. So, of course, they've been forsaken by God because of their unbelief. Just look up the word forsake in the Bible, and he talks about, uh, how, how about this for What burden? I will even forsake you. Who was that talking to? Look that one up. He interviews a number of Jewish rabbis and leaders to get authoritative answers regarding blasphemous statements in the Talmud, their beliefs about the writings of Moses, the failure to practice basic Jewish rituals like circumcision, and their use of the Star of David. Many such things that are supposed to prove that the Jews are beyond the reach of God. Again, he just tells a brazen lie here that we believe Jews are beyond the reach of God. You are a liar, sir. We believe that Jews can be saved whenever they want. All they have to do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and they shall be saved. I have personally won Jews to the Lord out soul winning through Marching to Zion and other videos that I put online. I've baptized Jews in my church that got saved. So we did not say that they're beyond the reach of God, you liar. You're the one who's claiming that they're already God's chosen people without Jesus. And you know what? With that belief, you're going to damn way more Jews to hell by acting like, oh, they're already God's people. No, they need to be told that they're not so that they can actually receive Christ and become God's people. Mr. Anderson is wasting his time gathering contemporary evidence against the Jews. The Bible has already told us everything we need to know about Jewish unbelief. So I'm wasting my time proving how bad the Jews are, and the Bible already tells us how bad the Jews are. That's what he's basically saying. Well, you know, you're right. Yeah, you guys should already realize this. But since you and all your fellow uh, independent fundamental Baptists don't seem to get it, that's why we have to make a movie like Marching Design. You're right. If people would actually just read the Bible and, and listen to sound biblical preaching, they wouldn't need this movie to state the obvious that the Jews are wicked. But... Apparently, you, you need to go back and watch it again, if anything. So it wasn't a waste of time. They crucified their own Messiah and are guilty of numerous crimes against God. This we know. In putting together all of this evidence, Anderson hopes to convince us that God has completely washed His hands of the Jews and has replaced them with the Christian church. Again, He has not washed His hands of them because the offer of salvation is still available to them, but they are not God's chosen people until they get saved, until they believe in Jesus. Which begs the question, is he suggesting that Christianity has met God's perfect standard in a way that Israel did not? If so, where is this great success? Roman Catholicism? The mainline churches? The emerging church? Pentecostalism? Or even independent Baptists? So here he puts forth this bizarre argument of, well, you know, if Israel failed and they got rejected, then, you know, he's going to have to reject Christianity because Christianity is a failure, you know, according to him. Folks, you can't compare apostate Christianity to Israel because, number one, there are millions and millions and millions of Christians that are not apostate. You know, he shows some queer wedding and some Catholic church. What about all the millions and millions and millions of Baptists in America alone. There are 50 million Baptists in America alone, okay? And yeah, are a lot of them apostates? Sure. But what about worldwide? There are millions and millions and millions of Christians who do please God. And why, what, why they should be rejected? They didn't reject Jesus. Why should they be rejected? No, they believe in Jesus. And in spite of their flaws, in spite of their faults, they're accepted. But he's like, well, if Israel's getting rejected for their faults, they're getting rejected first and foremost because they don't even believe in Jesus. We do believe in Jesus. That's a pretty big difference. It seems pretty clear from Scripture that the Bible teaches that Christianity will be almost completely apostate when the Lord returns. No, that isn't clear from Scripture, and that's a stupid, ridiculous belief. The Bible says that the people who do know their God will be strong and do exploits. There are going to be millions of great Christians in the end times doing all kinds of wonderful things for God. The whole gospel of the kingdom being preached in all the world before the end should, should show you that. Look, there are great things being done for God. Just because this guy's in a dead church, he wants to just project that onto us or something because he believes in the stupid dispensational doctrine of, oh, we're in the Laodicean church age, we're lukewarm. No, you're lukewarm, okay? 
Uh, right now, some of the greatest works for God are being done right now in 2019, and the gospel's being preached. So yeah, you can put up on the screen all these dumb examples, but you know what? There are a lot of great Christians out there doing a lot of great things for God. And no, when Christ returns, he's not going to come back and find everything virtually apostate. You know, that's, that's ridiculous. It's nonsense. Oh, well, it's clear in the Bible. No. And we see that on every hand. Just as Israel fell away from God, the Bible predicts the same thing for Christianity. Only if you're a Ruckmanite or reading a Schofield Bible and think that Laodicean church age is where we're living. No, the Bible does not predict that. Churches are not going to replace Israel. Churches are mirroring Israel. In both groups, we can expect a small remnant who follow the Lord in the truth that He has revealed. Because they remain in unbelief, Anderson believes that God has permanently rejected the Jews. But I would remind him that Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, Moses, and Paul also condemned Israel for their apostasy. But they never hinted that Israel would be ultimately forsaken by God. And in fact, they said just the opposite. Right. They weren't forsaken by God because God visited His people Israel by sending Jesus Christ to them. And Jesus Christ is still available to them. So they can get saved whenever they want. But if they don't believe in Jesus, they're doomed. I know I'm being repetitive, but it's so obvious. Why doesn't he get it? Jesus Christ lived in a day when Jews were consumed by factions, unbelief, and hardness of heart. Yet his last words on the cross proved that he was no follower of Stephen Anderson. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Well, thank you for proving that Jesus wasn't a follower of Stephen Anderson. I already knew that. Stephen Anderson is a follower of Jesus, not vice versa. And yeah, Jesus Christ wants to get people saved. He wants to forgive people. He wants people to get it right. But you know what? Sorry, you can't be forgiven without believing in Jesus. And I don't care if you're Jewish. You don't get a free pass. You have to believe in Jesus to get that forgiveness, period. Anderson believes it's right to hate those who oppose the truth. No, I don't believe it's right to hate those who oppose the truth. I believe it's right to hate those who hate God because the Bible says in Psalm 139, Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee, and am not I grieved against them that rise up against thee? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Uh, that's verses 21 and 22 of Psalm 139. But no, I don't hate the Jews because the Jews do not all hate God. Now, if there's someone who hates God, then I hate that person. That's what the Bible says. Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Second Chronicles 19.2. And so uh, my biblical views on love and hatred are just that. They're biblical. And no, he's trying to make it sound like I hate Jews or that I hate anybody who doesn't uh, believe in Christ. No, I love the lost and want them to be saved. Forgive them for they know not what they do. Amen. But... You know, they have to get saved, and there are people that are reprobate haters of God, and we're supposed to hate them. Let's think about others who have hated the Jews. The Egyptians, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, Roman Catholics, Hitler, Palestinians, liberals, antichrists of every type. I don't want to be numbered with that crowd. Furthermore, God doesn't hate the Jews. Moses didn't hate the Jews. Jesus and Paul didn't hate the Jews. But Satan and this wicked world system absolutely hate the Jews and anything else having to do with God. Yeah, the Jews probably put the swastikas on the gravestones themselves because they're constantly getting busted doing false flags like that where they spray swastikas on their own stuff so that they can claim a victim status. But anyway, that's another story. Point number two, Anderson attempts to make the false claim that evangelical Christians accept the Jews in their current state. To prove this, he uses John Hagee to represent evangelical Christianity. False teachers often use men of straw to make their point, and that's what we have here. Hagee is a far-out Pentecostal televangelist with a number of strange ideas. He's a good example for Anderson because Hagee does not believe that the Jews need evangelizing. But he in no way represents conservative, Bible-believing Christians. Bible-believing churches have always sought to bring Jews to a saving knowledge of Christ, and they certainly understand that God is not done in His dealings with the Jews. Using John Hagee is typical of the type of fraud that Anderson perpetrates in this video. So here he states that I'm trying to say that, you know, that they believe that Jews don't need Christ. Well, that's what they teach, okay? Yeah, they teach that Jews need Christ to get to heaven, but they teach that Jews do not need Christ 
in order to be blessed by God. They do not need Christ in order to be God's chosen people. They do not need Christ to inherit the promised land. That's what they teach. They teach that in spite of them rejecting Christ, and if you don't have the Son, you don't have the Father, the Bible says. In spite of them rejecting Christ, they're still God's chosen people. They're still uh, inheriting the promises of Abraham, the promised land. They're still blessed with with Abraham. They're chosen. So they, they are saying that they don't need Jesus. Yeah, they're saying that they need him to get to heaven, but they have this weird cognitive dissonance where they're going to hell, but they're God's people, and God blesses them all the way to hell or whatever. It doesn't make any sense what they believe. Point number three. Anderson attempts to prove that Christians have never accepted the Jews as God's chosen people, that this is some sort of recent doctrine. What Christians does he quote to make the case? Roman Catholic Church fathers and Protestants like Martin Luther. I certainly don't take my doctrinal positions from the fathers of the Roman Catholic Church and from Protestants. The Roman Catholic Church doesn't even know what the gospel is. Why should I listen to them about anything? And while there may be a lot about Martin Luther that I appreciate, particularly his bold stand against the Pope of Rome, Luther hated Baptists and he hated Jews. He was wrong on both of those counts. This is the problem with replacement theology. Replacement theology has its origins in the Roman Catholic Church and those groups that came out of her. How strange that a pastor of a fundamental Baptist church would hold this doctrine. But it is clear that Anderson will use almost anyone, including Roman Catholic Church fathers, to help reinforce his ridiculous arguments. No, actually the point that was being made was that that is what everybody has believed. That's what all denominations have believed. So we were just showing a spectrum of denominations and doctrines that believe that. You know what? Baptists only picked up this Zionist doctrine in the late 1800s. That is a fact, okay? Because the Schofield Reference Bible and Darby and Larkin and all that stuff came out in the late 1800s and it was propagated in the early 20th century. Historically, there has not been some big Zionist Baptist movement. And I would challenge the guy who put together this video to show us examples. What he fails to do is show any examples of Baptists from the 16, 17, and early 1800s that are promoting Zionism, you know, because my point was that it's a new doctrine and that it's not been mainstream until recently, which is true. Point number four, Anderson and the preachers who speak on this video tell us that God had nothing to do with the Jews' return to the land of Israel in 1948. Anderson and his cohorts must face the fact that their teaching is a direct attack on the movements of God on behalf of his people. Look, God had something to do with it in the sense that God created Satan and Satan was behind it. So in that sense, he had something to do with it. But sorry, Antichrist and the spirit of Antichrist and the spirit that works in the children of disobedience is not of God, okay? And if you don't have the Son, you don't have the Father. And the Bible says, who is a liar, but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ, he is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Well, Stephen Anderson saying that God isn't behind the Antichrist. Stephen Anderson believes that the Antichrist kingdom isn't of God. Duh. Of course it's not of God. It's of the Antichrist, of the devil. Yeah, God created the devil. God allows the devil to exist and, and to ultimately fulfill his will. Okay? Because, yeah, in the end times, the Antichrist needs to be in there. Look, the state of Israel was set up by Rothschild and the United Nations and all these wicked, evil, Christ-hating people. Okay? So, sorry, I don't believe God's behind that. It's ridiculous to say that God's behind such a wicked godless, violent, uh, Christ-rejecting movement. They are ignoring God's providential watch care for the seed of Abraham and His orchestration of the movement of nations to bring about His will in regard to Israel. I guess he forgot that for a long time it was the Soviet Union who was Israel's biggest ally. I guess God was working through the Soviet Union to set up a communist kibbutzim in Israel and uh, all the socialism and garbage of the Jews. I guess that's all God's providential work. No, it's called nuclear weapons. It's called making alliances with the Soviet Union and later the United States. It's called backroom deals. It's called the rulers of the darkness of this world. That's not God's providential watch care because an evil state filled with Christ-rejecting people 
has been set up in the Middle East that's pro-Sodomite and pro-everything that the Bible's against. The truth is, God has brought Israel from the four corners of the earth for His final dealings with them in the very land that He promised them. There has never been a miracle any greater than this, that God punished His people by forcing them to wander this earth where they were persecuted but not destroyed, only to bring them back as He promised. So the resurrection of Jesus Christ isn't the greatest miracle. The parting of the Red Sea isn't the greatest miracle. Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead isn't the greatest miracle. No, the greatest miracle is the Holocaust. And he shows these pictures of these uh, Jews that are being punished and them being brought back into the promised land. And it's the biggest miracle ever. It's not a miracle. It's the devil's plan for the end times to install the Antichrist. And he's going to claim to be Jesus. And a lot of suckers are going to believe in him. And they're going to think the Antichrist is Jesus, and it's going to be a bunch of Zionists that get sucked into it too, by the way. I often point to this astonishing turn of events to help others see the hand of God working in this world today. I firmly believe that it is a proof that the end of things is at hand. And yet this wonderful, marvelous fulfillment of prophecy dealing with the Jews is attributed by Anderson and his cultic followers to the Antichrist and his one world government not to the hand of God. And so if it's not the Lord who brought them back, then who did bring them back? It was the spirit of Antichrist that brought them back to the Promised Land. It was the United Nations who brought them back to the Promised Land. In Jesus' day, the Pharisees attributed the work of God to Beelzebub. Is this any different? So basically what he's saying there is, if you're not a Zionist, if you're not for the Christ-rejecting secular state of Israel, you have blasphemed the Holy Ghost. If you believe that the spirit of Antichrist set up the state of Israel, you've blasphemed the Holy Ghost, according to this guy. Well, here's the thing. The Bible says, who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Messiah? He's Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. So I guess according to him, the Apostle John is blaspheming the Holy Ghost by claiming that the spirit that rejects the Messiah is the spirit of Antichrist. Do the Jews reject the Messiah? Yes or no? Then they're Antichrist. Do the Jews in the state of Israel reject Jesus as the Messiah? They believe that there's another Messiah that's not Jesus. That makes them Antichrist. So if I say, hey, it was actually the Antichrist spirit working behind these antichrist people who John says are antichrists, then now he's accusing me of having blasphemed the Holy Ghost. Is this any different than when they said that Jesus was possessed with Beelzebub? I mean, if you are against the state of Israel, you're like someone who said Jesus is demon-possessed. So he's saying that basically uh, those who reject the Zionist propaganda of the last hundred years are beyond salvation because we've committed the unpardonable sin. I'm, I'm telling you, these Zionists are warped. To believe in replacement theology, ultimately you must somehow deal with the fact that there are people who are called Jews, who have always been called Jews, who have been recognized as Jews in every nation in which they have resided, and who have somehow come back to Israel after 2,000 years of wandering. It almost sounds providential, doesn't it? Yeah, almost, until you realize that they left brown and came back white. It's not just some ethnic perfect people group that's just been preserved and scattered all over the world and then came back. It's a, it's a club that they've been in for the last 2,000 years of, of rejecting Jesus, rejecting the Messiah, believing in a Messiah other than Jesus. It's a club. It's a religion. People have come in and out of it. All throughout the last 2,000 years, Jews have gotten saved and they stopped being Jews. They started being Christians. And then other people who are wicked people converted to Judaism because of their hatred and rejection of Jesus. And then their children are raised as Jews. So this group of Jews is just a group of Christ-rejecting people that have had this club for the last 2,000 years where they say, well, give us the Bible without Jesus. Give us the Old Testament with Jesus removed. Let's gut this religion of Jesus because they don't even want to retain him in their knowledge, okay? That's what the architects of this religion have done. The whole Old Testament is pointing to Jesus. Judaism is an Old Testament religion that just guts the Bible of every reference to Jesus, which just completely perverts and distorts the Bible. Only a wicked person would want to pervert and distort the Bible. So all these white people over in Israel, 
You know, they're just the children of converts to Judaism. People have converted in and out of this religion. It, it isn't some miraculous preservation of this ethnic group. That is a myth. It's a fraud. No one, I repeat, no one, not even one person today called a Jew has a genealogy that goes all the way back to the beginning. So who knows where they came from? And if you look how white and European they are, red hair and freckles in many cases, it's pretty obvious that they're not the same ethnic group. In fact, it perfectly parallels numerous prophecies that predict that very thing. Oh yeah, so perfect. They've rejected Christ for the last 2,000 years. Why didn't he bring them back 300 years ago, 500 years ago? Because they were rejecting Christ and unbelief. They're not going to be blessed like that. And all of a sudden now they're here. Why? For such a time as this. I'll tell you why. Because it's gearing up for the end times, for the Antichrist, the spirit of Antichrist. So, oh, it just perfectly parallels these prophecies. Really? Because all the Old Testament prophecies I see about the children of Israel being blessed and saved and brought back in the land has to do with them repenting and getting right with God. The fifth and final point we would make from Marching Design is that Anderson and his followers tell us that God is not even interested in a physical land. I mean, can you believe that? God isn't into dirt. <laughs> Who'd have thunk it? Yeah, God's interested in people. God's going to torch that land and destroy it. You know where the holy ground is? It's wherever God's people are. It's wherever God is. You know that Mount Sinai with the burning bush where Moses was told to take off his feet because he was on holy ground? It wasn't in Israel. That holy ground was actually in Arabia. Okay? So in Arabia, it was holy ground. Why? Because of the presence of God. So, you know, I don't think God's interested in the land. Like God's just some land developer or something. I mean, it's so weird the way they talk about the land. We as Christians are looking for a new Jerusalem. We're looking for a heavenly city. If Anderson is right about this, there is not one thing we can know for certain from Scripture. Virtually every page of the Old Testament is taken up with a specific land and a specific people. Folks, if you don't believe that God's into that physical land like the dirt, the rocks, and the trees, everything's up for grabs. There's nothing we can know for certain. Because according to him, virtually every page of the Old Testament is about a specific land. Really? Okay, let, let's think about this. Every page, really? Almost every page is about a specific land? I don't think so. I, I can think of many, many pages that go on and on and on about spiritual things, not about a specific land. You know, it's about a specific... You know what? You're carnal. That's why you think it's all about a physical, specific land that's all going to be burned up and destroyed anyway. The Bible's a spiritual book interpreted by spiritual people. That's why you don't get it, because you're not saved. And again, like I said later in the series, he's going to uh, attack the doctrine of salvation by faith alone and say that we're preaching a false gospel because we just teach that it's believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You know, that's why he doesn't understand a spiritual book and everything's so carnal to him. The Abrahamic covenant gives specific details about the land that is at stake, and that covenant has never been rescinded. So God's covenant has never been rescinded, huh? Well, I wonder why it's called the Old Covenant then. I wonder that's why it's called the Old Testament, where he made that agreement with the children of Israel. Um, the Bible says in Hebrews 8, 13, and that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old, now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. So yeah, that covenant has been rescinded, actually. Not only does replacement theology confuse important Bible doctrines for today, it destroys the prophetic element of future events. The Old Testament contains hundreds of specific statements about the millennial reign of Christ in the land of Israel. The incredible power of Bible prophecy rests in its unmistakable clarity. You can read it and make predictions based on what you read. Alexander Keith, a preacher of yesteryear, did just that. Writing in the 1850s, he saw Israel scattered as sheep having no shepherd, but he read in the prophets of a day yet future when Israel would be brought back to the land. He admitted that it seemed almost impossible to believe, knowing the geopolitical circumstances of his day, yet he confidently asserted that Israel would come home. It is enough for Christians to know that 2,000 years cannot prevent the heaven-chartered right of the seed of Abraham to the final and everlasting possession of the land of Canaan. So how dare I use Protestants to make my point earlier, uh, but it's okay for him to use Alexander Keith, a Church of Scotland and Free Church minister, not a Baptist. It's okay for him to use Protestants 
to make his point, but I can't use Protestants to make my point. If Alexander Keith had been a follower of Stephen Anderson, he would have concluded that there would be no future prophetic fulfillment regarding the land of Israel, but he would have been wrong. Okay, so by that logic, I guess the millennium is already here. He's claiming that somehow these prophecies about the millennium, about God's people inhabiting the promised land, were somehow fulfilled or are being fulfilled starting in 1948. What about the Antichrist? Has he just completely forgotten about this fraud, this imposter called the Antichrist that's going to rule and reign from Jerusalem before Jesus Christ comes? Like somehow he thinks that the children of Israel, quote unquote, being brought back to the promised land is somehow necessary to bring in the millennial reign of Christ. Look, Jesus is going to come on a white horse. And he's going to take the power. He doesn't need the U.S. government to give nukes to Israel to somehow fulfill prophecy. It's fulfilling prophecy of bringing in the Antichrist. He just completely has forgotten about the Antichrist and is just like, yep, 2,000 years of history of the Jews and then boom, they're going to the promised land. It's just heading right into the millennium. You forgot a one stop along the way called the Antichrist. Today we live in a day when blind Israel is back in the land waiting for the culmination of all things. Yep, they're sitting there waiting for the Antichrist so that they can believe in him. Yep, they're ready to worship the Antichrist, ready to roll. As far as future events, Anderson believes that Israel and the unbelieving denominations of the world will receive the Antichrist. We believe the same thing. But for Anderson, it ends there, with Israel destroyed by God at the height of their apostasy. In Anderson's twisted handling of Scripture, God's judgment will gloriously fall on Israel and those who believe in Christ will triumph over her. This is total garbage, another lying straw man where he tries to say that I'm claiming that the Christians will triumph over Israel, like it's going to be Christians destroying Israel. No, God's going to use the Antichrist and he's going to use heathen to destroy Israel. He always did that in the Old Testament. He used the Babylonians, he used the Assyrians, he used the Philistines. He's going to use wicked heathens to destroy Israel. What is he talking about? That Like I think the church is going to destroy Israel or something. It's ridiculous. Israel will be thrown down and the church will be lifted up, according to Anderson. No, that's not according to Anderson because I don't believe in the universal, invisible Catholic church that you believe in. I believe in local churches and you're putting words in my mouth because you're just making stuff up at this point. But the Bible does not end that way. In the end, God will bring obstinate Israel to a knowledge of the truth. And so all Israel shall be saved as it is written. There shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. Right, so if all Israel shall be saved, how can you claim that unsaved people are Israel? How can you claim that people that are on their way to hell are the true Israel? They're on their way to hell. They're not saved. All Israel shall be saved. You know why? Because they're not all Israel which are of Israel. That's what he already established in the previous chapters 9 and 10. Israel's very apostasy is a fulfillment of prophecy. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. Their unbelief is a miracle in and of itself. Wow, what a miracle. Let's, let's even celebrate their unbelief. I mean, I just love Jews so much. I just want to celebrate everything. Even their unbelief is a miracle. It's so awesome. Isn't it great how God did this miracle where he made them not believe? This is nonsense. Each time they celebrate the Passover, they are acknowledging that a lamb paid the penalty for their sins. Each time they look upon the Passover matzah, they are handling a piece of bread which is striped and pierced. Each time they pray next year in Jerusalem, they are being reminded that God will ultimately call their nation home. Jesus promised them blindness, and blindness they have. But one day the scales will fall from their eyes, just as the scales fell from Paul's eyes. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. And one shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thine hands? Then he shall answer, those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Your point? God is not done with the Jews. Before the day that their eyes are opened, I believe that they are going to endure days which are going to make the Holocaust seem like a walk through the garden. 
I believe that the Jews' worst days are yet ahead. But guess what? I also believe, from my reading of Scripture, that the Jews' best days are ahead. Jesus Christ is going to split the Mount of Olives in two. God is going to level Jerusalem, and healing waters are going to flow out toward the Mediterranean Sea and toward the Dead Sea. The desert is going to bloom like a rose. The lame and the blind and the sick will be healed, and the Jews will be restored. All nations shall flow into physical Jerusalem, just as the Bible says. One of the great dangers of Stephen Anderson's teaching is one that Paul warned about, the wild branches boasting against the natural branches. He said that we Gentiles should walk with fear and trepidation in this area, and not to be haughty. Anderson, though, has no fear to violate these very serious warnings and to teach others to do so. Anyone who could read the Old Testament and compare it with the New Testament and come away with the idea that God is finished with Israel is not qualified to teach Sunday school to first graders, much less pastor a church. And again, he brings up the idea of me supposedly not being qualified to pastor a church. That's a sore subject with him that he brought up a few times in this video, if you, if you were listening carefully. Uh, I'm not qualified. That's because he himself is not qualified to pastor a church. He has disqualified himself from pastoring, and he teaches Sunday school. So that's why he says, well, this guy, Pastor Anderson's not even qualified to teach Sunday school, let alone pastor church. It's because he's jealous of the fact that I'm a pastor, that I have a big following, that we made this movie, that millions of people, that's what's really going on as far as this envy. Just like the wicked Jews were envious of the apostles when they preached Christ and, and multitudes of people were getting saved. You know what? Faithful Word Baptist Church and uh, our friends and other churches that we labor with and the pastors, many of whom were, were featured in the film Marching Design, you know, are winning a lot of people to Christ, doing great things for God. This guy in his wicked heart is envious because he's disqualified and he's not a pastor and he doesn't have any following and nobody's watching his stupid videos. And so that's what this really comes down to. That's why that keeps coming out of his mouth. But he keeps saying that, I'm saying, Stephen Harrison says God's done with Israel. Really? What? It's funny how you didn't play that part of Marching Design where I said God's done with Israel. He just keeps saying that over and over again. I don't believe God's done punishing Israel. I don't believe God's done uh, pouring out his wrath on Israel. God has all kinds of plans for wiping out Israel. And for those who get saved, those who believe in Christ, hey, they're going to go into the kingdom of God, the saved, born-again Jews who get saved. But then they're not Jews anymore because then they'll start calling themselves Christians. But saved, born-again children of God who come out of Judaism, yeah, they're going into the millennium. They're going to inherit the promised land. All the saved Israelites from the Old Testament are going to be enjoying the millennial kingdom with Jesus Christ. Every saved person, whether they're Jew or Gentile, is going to that kingdom. He says God's on with Israel. No, God is going to punish unbelieving Israel and glorify believing Israel. And uh, this whole uh, presentation that he has here is just garbage. It's just his sour grapes about Marching Design being such a powerful, successful film. And that's why at the beginning of the video, he's complaining about how this doctrine is infiltrating churches. Yeah, it's spreading because it's true. And everybody, as soon as they watch Marching Design, instantly knows that it's true because it confirms everything that they've already been reading the Bible, if they've already read their Bible. This guy doesn't get it. He has proven himself to be a false teacher. So anyway, God willing, I'll make a response to the other... Uh, parts of this series as well that deal with different subjects. This was the one on um, the Jews, obviously. God bless you. Have a great day.